Okay. Um, Hi, this is part 26 of our series on the first chapter of Sanhedrin. And um, if you would, are listening to this at some point in the future, or you want to contact me, I'm Deborah Clapper at gmail.com. Um, in the meantime, I have my screen shared. So hopefully everyone can see together with me. Um, and we are, this is our last class on calendars. Um, our last class trying to piece together what Rabbi Yose and Rabbi Yehuda respectively thought about when the equinox is or is not supposed to be with res respect to Sukkot. I can't say that I'm 100% certain that we're going to be sure we've understood it at the end of tonight, but either way, we get to go on. Um, okay, so we begin with a couple of different references back to the material from last week. And our first one is this, a murmur. Um, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, shtei adot b'chodesh esrim yom. We had quoted Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yose uh, in th at least three distinct texts last week um, in their opinions about when the... Um, when the equinox can't be in the fall, such that if it were going to be then, we would have to make a leap year in order to prevent that from happening. Um, and this is one of them. Rabbi Yehuda had said that two parts of, well, first he had said, which we're not quoting here, that if the equinox is not going to be in the first two parts of Tishrei, then you have to have a leap, a leap year. And then he had said, and I, what, why did I say two, the first two parts of Tishrei, two parts, of the month is 20 days. And that is what our quote is here. Okay, so that would mean that the equinox has to fall in the first two thirds of Tishrei or uh, you have to have a leap year so that it will. Rabbi Yosei Omer, Mechashvin Shisha Saryom Lifneha Pesach Maver. So in that same quote, we had quoted Rabbi Yosei as saying that we calculate the six, 16 days before Pesach or the 16th day of the month in which Pesach falls or something like that. It was unclear what he meant. And then we, um, we declare a leap year. And we had last time said that this translation that I have here is the same translation we used last week. And so last week we said that what it meant was that if the vernal equinox is later than 16 days into Nisan, then we make a leap year in order to prevent that from happening. And Rashi last week had said that if the vernal equinox is on the 17th of Nisan, the autumnal equinox will always be on the 22nd of Tishrei. Um, that's gonna be problematic in a few minutes, but that is what Rashi said. And I don't have a time machine with which to go back and ask him how he understood the rest of the Gemara. Okay, the problem is that the Gemara says, Hainu Rabbi Yehuda, this position of Rabbi Yosei, that we um, it, declare a leap year if the, um, if the equinox is going to be on the 16th uh, or later of Nisan, is the same thing as Rab Rabbi Yehuda said, because that's saying that the um, fall equinox, the autumnal equinox, will be on the 21st or later in Tishrei. Um, and so they seem to be describing this exact same year, just from different months. So the Gemara says, Yom Tkufa Gomer Yom Tkufa Matchil The difference between them is that one of them thinks that the equinox is the last day of the previous season, and the other one thinks that the equinox is the first day of the following season. And, but it, we, it doesn't tell us which one is which, and that's gonna be a bit of a pattern tonight where we're going to say, well, it must be the difference between them. Is this, is it the first day of the season or the last day of the season thing? But in fact, there's no way to tell from what they said who thinks which thing, um, which has been a problem consistently all the way through, especially with Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yosei. We 
last week had a contradiction between two different Brito about which way they, uh, each of them individually fell on that issue. And that problem is not going to go away. We, we, we still suspect that they disagree, but we don't know who thinks what. Okay, so now we're moving on to our next quote from last week. Amar Mar. So somebody said, said last week in a Abraita, the, if the autumnal equinox is not going to be by the 16th of uh, the month in which Sukkot falls, which is Tishrei, then we don't have a leap year. Right? We're only... Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's really wrong. The autumnal equinox is going to be, is going to be before the, it's going to be after the 16th of Tishrei, then we do have a leap year. I'm sorry. We don't have a leap year. Um, but according to Rabbi Yosei, it's if the equinox won't fall by the 16th that we don't have a leap year. The thing is that the 16th, uh, Rabbi Yosei was talking about the 16th of Tishrei. And the 16th of Tishrei is the same thing as we said as the 21st of, sorry, the 16th of Nisan is the same thing as the 21st of Tishrei. So these are not quite the same dates. It sounds like Rabbi Yosei thinks that if the equinox doesn't, that Hashiv Sar Nisar that if the equinox is going to fall on the 17th or 18th of Nisan, which is to say the fall equinox is going to fall on the 21st, 22nd or 23rd of Tishrei, that we don't have a we don't have a leap year. And the standard, if we if we set a standard of the 16th of Tishrei, and then we suddenly say, that, no, wait, the standards of the 22nd of Tishrei, that, those are not the same thing. And it's worse, because the Hamar, she saw so the Pesach in Batsir Lo. But he said that we are only going to make a leap year if the equinox is going to be by the the 16th of Nisan. But if it's going to fall earlier than that, we don't make a leap. We don't make a leap year. So the Gemara says, no, actually, it must be he didn't mean the 16th of Nisan. Yeah, he would also make a leap year if it was going to be on the 17th of Nisan or the 18th of Nisan. Those are both plenty late enough. That's later than the standard that we, we set before. But, and this is really weird, the ID to Tana Resha. But since the Mishnah was talking about the 16th of the of Nisan for something else at the beginning of the Mishnah, it said the 16th of the 16th of Tishrei later in the Mishnah. And we're just using the number 16 to mean sometime during the month, even though we actually care very much which day of the month it is. It sounds to me like we're actually claiming there's a, a scribal error here that the scribe transcribed their date from the first half of the Brita to the second half of the Brita, and it's, this is actually just the wrong date. I don't think it can be that we think we can say 16 and you'll understand that what we really meant was 19, because that's um, just weird. I, I, I think we must be claiming this actually a mistake in the Brita. Um, Rabbi Shimon Omer, af shisha sar Rabbi Shimon, on the other hand, and we're still quoting the end of the same Brita here, that the um, even if the autumnal equinox won't be before the 16th of Tishrei, before Sukkot, we're still gonna make a we're still gonna make a leap year. It sounds like we're gonna make a leap year unless the equinox is the 15th of Tishrei or early. Now the 15th of Tishrei is the first day of Sukkot. And we have been until now assuming that even the most stringent position thought that only Chol Hamoed Sukkot needed to be in the fall, not the first day of Sukkot. 
And the reason we've been assuming that is because the verse that we learned that it needs to be in the fall from makes reference to Sukkot as the Chag HaAsif, the holiday of the gathering. Gathering presumably being the agricultural practice at the end of the season of bringing all of the produce indoors before the winter. But the, the way that the agricultural cycle works in Israel is it, it only rains in the winter. It does not rain between Pesach and Sukkot, or at least it's not supposed to rain between Pesach and Sukkot, and it usually does not. And so what happens is you spend the summer harvesting the grain that grew last year, and you can do all of the processing outdoors because it's not going to rain. It's safe to leave your food outside. It won't get wet. And so you dry the grain and you winnow it and you pile it up and you bag it and you whatever processing you're going to do, maybe we can grind it into flour. It's still outdoors. And then by Sukkot, you got to take it inside because at that point it's going to start raining. And then your food will rot if you leave it outside because it'll get wet. So the um, Sukkot is the holiday of gathering. That gathering here does not mean harvesting. The harvesting happened a long time ago. Gathering means schlepping everything indoors into your barn for storage for the winter. Um, and that is an activity we would not do on Yom Tov. And so we have until now been assuming that the part of the holiday that is called the holiday of gathering is just the intermediate days, the, the Chol HaMoed, which would be starting with the 16th of Tishrei and does not include the 15th of Tishrei, which is Yom Tov, when we would, as I said, not do agricultural work. But it sounds like Rabbi Shimon thinks that we are going to require the equinox to be on the 15th or earlier, so he does sound like he thinks the first day of Sukkot has to be in the fall. Um, okay, Hainu Tanakama, no wait, that's the same thing as the first position in the Brita. The first position in the Brita said that the equinox has to be by the first day of Sukkot, but he thought that the first day of, that the equinox is the last day of summer. So it still amounts to, he thinks that the fall has to start by the day after the first day of Sukkot. So as usual, we say, no, the difference between them is going to be that one of them thinks that the equinox is the end of the summer and the other thinks that the equinox is the beginning of the fall. The low Messiah, and we don't know which one's which. Okay, so one, somebody here, either Rabbi Shimon or the Tanakama, somebody thinks that the first day of fall has to be at the very latest, the first day of Sukkot. And the other one thinks that the first day of the fall has to be the second day of Sukkot. That guy we understand. That's the position we've had all along, which is that all of Fulhamoid has to be in, in the fall. Okay. Achirim Omrim. Others say, um, Muto, that the um, equinox has to fall in the minority of Tishrei, meaning in the less than half of the beginning of Tishrei. The Kama Muto, how much is its minority? Arba Saryom. 14 days. The, um, the equinox has to fall within the first 14 days of, of Tishrei. My Kasavri, so what do they think about, of course, the same question we've been asking about everybody else, is the equinox the first day of the fall or the last day of the summer? If they think that the uh, equinox is the last day of summer, then then if all you want is that you have the all of Sukkot to be in the fall, then you're going to have that even if the equinox falls on the even, I wrote in English the 14th, but you'd have it even if the equinox falls on the 15th. Um, if you're only worried about Cholomoed. Um, Amar of Shmuel Bar of Yitzchak. So, so the, we can't figure out why we would want the equinox to be as early as in the first 14 days of Tishrei. So Roshmuel Bar Yitzchak says, Achirim bitkufat nisan kain. So we're going to have several different interpretations of these achirim. We're just going to call them the others because that's what the word means. Um, but it doesn't actually say who they are. Roshmuel Bar Yitzchak says they're really talking about the spring, the vernal equinox. Dichtiv, shemor et chodesh 
So they're gonna, they're basing their calendar theory on an entirely different pasuk, which is not, not the pasuk about Sukkot that we've been basing ourselves on, but a different one, which is Shamor al Chodesh Avi, which means I've loosely translated as keep the month of the spring, which sounds like a very difficult mitzvah to do because it sounds like gibberish. Um, that it's difficult to know what it would mean to keep the month of the spring. Um, so that is why we interpret it here. Shmor Aviv Shel Tkufa, Shehe Be Chodesh Nisan or Be Chadash Nisan. And the truth is, I think they're reading it both ways. So it's very hard to read out loud. But keep the, the uh, spring of the equinox, we'll call that the spring equinox, in the new part of the month of Nisan. Um, so that, that would be earlier actually than anything else that we've seen. We've, we have not yet seen anybody requiring that the, fall, the spring equinox fall as early as in the first, the first half of Nisan, but that is what this is requiring. And so that would require that the spring equinox fall by the 14th of Nisan so that it will be in the first half of Nisan. But the Gemara has a suggestion, because the thing is that if you have the standard of the 14th of Nisan in order to be in the first half of Nisan, then that's a little bit more than we needed. Because imagine for a moment that the equinox was otherwise going to be on the 15th of Nisan. So you could add a whole month and now the equinox will be on the 15th of Adar. Or we could add one day by making Adar a 30 day month when it's usually a 29 day month. And now the equinox will be on the 14th of Nisan, which is also fine. So the Gemara wants to know, Adar, why are we being, going so far as to make a leap year? We could solve the problem at least if it happens to be that one specific configuration that the equinox is gonna be on the 15th of Nisan, we could solve the problem with a less extreme measure by adding one day to Adar. So if Acha Bar Yaakov says, Tana mi lamala mi lamala lamata kachashib, the Tana is counting from top to bottom, meaning he's setting a, uh, he's, he's, Say, he's saying what the last date is that the equinox can be rather than the first day that it can't be. Um, and so it, that, that moves everything over by one day. So that's fine. So we just, we misunderstood the Tana. What he said was moved over by one day. And the, um, and in fact, if it could be fixed by only one day, sure, we would add one day to Adar. But otherwise we need to, otherwise we're gonna need to add a, uh, we need to add a month if it's more than a day. The Hachikama, and this is what he meant to say, Ad miuto ma'abrin, kama miuto arbas arba sarim. And he said, we are going to um, make a leap year if it's up to, the, the minority of the month, the minority of the month is 14 days, not 14 days being the first day on which we make a leap year, if the equinox will be then, but the last day on which we don't. Okay, so that takes care of the position that Achirim were really talking about Nisan, but Ravina has a different solution to our problem. He says, Ravina says, no, really, they were talking about Tishrei when they, and they really do mean that the equinox has to fall in the first half of Tishrei. And they think that not only do you need to have all of Chol HaMoed Sukkot be in the fall, but you also need you know, the first day of Sukkot, the Yom Tov, to be in the fall. And that's why they're setting their standard a day earlier than anybody else. Yom Tov Rishon, wait a minute. How do, you, how do you say that the first day of Sukkot needs to be in the fall? It says a day of gathering. And as I said before, you can't gather the grain on, it on the first day of Yom Tov. So why would you think that that would be the holiday of gathering? 
And so they conclude Chag Habab Bizman Asifa. Now it's really, it's the holiday that happens at the time of year at which you gather. It's not actually a holiday on which you gather. It's the holiday which is at about the time of year when you gather. Um, okay. And that is the end of the calendar. I apologize for the extent to which I have been muddled. Um, the Gemara is somewhat muddled itself, but I'm sure that I'm more muddled than is ne really necessary and, and it's my fault and I'm sorry. Okay, back to our next topic in the Gemara. We are moving on to the next thing that was in the Mishnah, which is smichat zikenim. And I have translated that ambiguously as elders placing of hands because in fact, it is ambiguous. It is not at all clear, just based on the words in the Mishnah, whether we're talking about the placing of hands that is done by elders or the placing of hands on the heads of elders. Right, and so I have translated it ambiguously so that it could be either one. For the rest of this evening though, we are going to work on the assumption that we are talking about the placing of hands by elders. Next week, we will complicate that and bring in the possibility that the hands are being placed on the heads of the elders. The, um, tonight, though, we're going to assume, to start with, that we're talking about a passage that's in this week's Parsha. In the fourth chapter of Sefer Vayikra, the um, Torah talks about a sacrifice which is going to be brought if the uh, Jewish people as a whole sin. And um, in fact, I believe that we, halakhically, we assume that this is a sacrifice that's brought if the whole Jewish people sin because the Sanhedrin tell them to. But that particular aspect does not appear in tonight's Gemara, so um, let's, let's shelve that for the moment. Let, let me read you the passage that we're referring to, at least part of it. V'im kol adai Yisrael yishku, and if all of the congregation of Israel sin, um, error, it's sin in error, v'ne'elam davar me'ine ha'kahal, and a thing is hidden from the eyes of the community, and they do one of all of the mitzvot of Hashem, which should not be done. Right? That means they did something which the mitzvah says not to do. And they are guilty. And then the sin that they sinned becomes known to them. Then the community will sacrifice a bull as a sin offering. And they'll bring it in front of the um, Ohel Moed, which in uh, this context means in front of the entrance to the Holy of Holies. And the um, elders of the congregation will put their hands, will place their hands on the head of the bull in front of Hashem. And he, somebody, it doesn't say who, will um, slaughter the bull, Lifne Hashem, in front of God. Then there are instructions for how to actually um, bring the sacrifice uh, <coughs> to the altar and how to burn it. Okay, but this, this placing of hands of the elders on the head of this bull, that is the placing of hands that we are working with tonight. You might not have thought that was a judicial action done by a court at all, right? It would be entirely possible to read this as a, I don't know, more of an executive action. Even if you suppose that the elders are governmental types, it, it doesn't sound like it necessarily needs to be on the list of behaviors of the court and how many members of the court are needed, like we have been dealing with this whole chapter. Uh, but it's gonna be very clear that our Gamara thinks it absolutely is a, uh, a uh, an action of of the of the judicial body, um, probably because they assume that it's the judicial body's fault because they judge something wrong um, that this whole thing happened. In any case, back in the Gemara, Tanu Rabbanan. So it says in a brayta, this samchuzikne, 
right? And the, the elders of the congregation will place, and they'll place their hands. And so we're gonna interpret this in order to understand it. It could have been, if it just said elders, it could have meant that these are just the elders of the marketplace. It is not clear to me, and I did not, in the amount of research I had time to do today, find clarification on this. It is not clear to me whether the elders of the marketplace just means old people or whether it means judges, but not important enough judges to be calling them the judges of the Sanhedrin. Um, either way, if it had just said elders, that would have been a vaguer term and it, it, it could have been judge, elders in general. But Talmud Lomar Eda, that's why it says the word congregation, because the elders of the congregation, that's a specific group of elders. But even then, if Eda, if it had said just congregation, then that could have been included the Katne Eda, the most minor members of the congregation, which Rashi thinks means members of local smaller Sanhedrins, although I think it's possible to read the words also that it means less important members of the great Sanhedrin, but that does not seem to be how anyone reads it. Talmud Lomar Ha'ida. So that's why the Torah has to say the elders of the congregation, the congregation tells you that this is the Sanhedrin, the great court in Yerushalayim that sits in the temple. And we're talking about the judges that sit specifically on that court, not any old group of elders, not any old group of judges, not any court, but those specific judges, they're miyuchadim shabaida, the unique members of the unique congregation. The Kameh. Okay, fine. So they have to be members of the Sanhedrin. But how many members of the Sanhedrin do I need? Okay, so when we're gonna, for those of you who were here back at the very beginning of the chapter, you'll recognize the kind of arithmetic we're about to start doing here. Visam chushnaim. So there's a verb that says they shall place. That's one plural verb. Um, a plural verb implies that at least two people are doing something. So that must mean I have at least two. And zikne, I have elders. That's a plural noun that implies that I have at least two. Um, so instead of saying it's the same two because it's the subject of the verb and its own verb, and of course they both have to be plural, we are instead going to say this has to be at least two and that has to be at least two and two plus two is four. Except the Ain Beitin Shakul, but you cannot have a court with an even number of judges. So Mosifina Lehem Odechad. So we add one more. Two plus two plus one is five. Hare Kan Chamisha. So there's a total of five. Divrei Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says we have five because I have two plural words. I apologize. I think in the um, in the outline at the end of the packet it says two verbs. One of them is a noun. I that was a mistake. Um, so I have two plural words. Each of them counts for at least two people. Plus I need one more for an odd number. Rabbi Yehuda gets five. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon on the other hand is only counting the noun. He's not interested in the verb. He says, Ziknei Shnaim, elders is two. I need at least two elders. The Ein Beitin Shakul, and I can't have an even number on a court. So Mosifina lehem odechad. So we add, have to add one more. Hare kan shlosha. So that's a total of three. Okay, so now we're going to go back to Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda, who are, of course, not literally here. They're long dead by the time we're writing this Gemara. But we're going to go back and try to imagine why each of them rejected the other's answer, which is something that we have seen before. The Rabbi Shimon. So you, hey, Rabbi Shimon, but it, it, it wrote, there's a, the, a plural verb here, v'samchu, they shall place. So why don't you count that for two more like Rabbi Yehuda did? And Rabbi Shimon, were he here, would tell us, that word is needed for itself, meaning it I wouldn't know that they're supposed to place their hands unless it told me they have to place their hands. And you can only use a word for a midrash if it's not, if it's extra. The word elders 
can teach me that I need two elders because that actually is itself, right? It's coming to tell me that I need elders. It's plural. I can't have elders with only one elder. So I have to have at least two elders. But I, that's, that doesn't require any fancy footwork. But in order to then learn anything extra from a different word, the other word would have to be somehow unnecessary in its own context. And then we could learn extra information from it. We could decide that it's basically code from information that it uh, does not seem to be its only or straightforward meaning. But it, if it's necessary for its own meaning, then you can't prove that it's code because maybe it just says what it says. And Rabbi Shimon says, no, no, no I, I, that's how I know they're supposed to put their hands there. So it's just saying what it's saying. Okay. So let's go back to Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda, look, what do you think about this? You, how can you use this word? Isn't it necessary for itself? So Rabbi Yehuda would say, no, it's, it's not necessary for itself. Meaning I would have known that the elders need to put their hands on the head of the bull, even if it had never said the word and they will put. The imkem. Because if it were so, I mean, the de lo ati visam chulid rasha, that it, if it were so that the word and they shall put was not intended to be interpreted, then lichtov zikne ha'ida yidehem al roshapar. This is a little bit hard to accept, but it ought to have written in the Torah, the elders of the congregation, their hands on the head of the book. And I would have figured out is that in order for the elders of the congregation's hands to end up on the bull, the elders of the congregation will have to put their hands on the head of the bull um, in order for their hands to be put. Isn't so that a little strange? <laughs> I it's mean, more I've, than a little strange. It's, we've, not, it's not logically inconsistent. It's true that if your hands are supposed to be somewhere, I could deduce that somebody had to put your hands there probably you, but it is stylistically, it would be extremely odd for the Torah to have been this way. This is not the way the Torah usually talks. The Torah exactly does what I was just going to say. We've seen this kind of argument so many times before, but um, like, what would this one say with, with the other one's um, uh, interpretation? But, but this just does not seem reasonable <laughs> at now, this all. This one really seems over the top. And I would even say that this sounds to me like the kind of thing you say when you already inherited this Midrash, you know that this Midrash is supposed to be here and you're not the one who wrote it and you're guessing as to why it has to uh -huh. be here. That, and I, I think that will be supported more later on that Rabbi Yehuda's uh, Midrash fundamentally he believes that it's right because he inherited it not because there's a, a really strong inter, uh, interpretive reason for, for having it of course that doesn't that just pushes the problem back a generation or two because somebody wrote this Midrash um, but we're not in the end going to be dependent on this um, at least not fully so and Rabbi Shimon what would what would Rabbi Shimon respond to that like isn't he okay with if their hands are there it must have gotten there somehow i don't need a verb um so here's what he would say if it were written like that then um have amina my al this summer so if if it just said their hands are on the bull bull's head i would think uh, their hands are somewhere near the bull's head not that they have to put their hands on top of the bull's head. And, and, and smicha requires you to lean on the animal. Like it, it's, a, it's a pretty specific method of putting your hands on the, the animal's head. So I wouldn't have assumed that it was quite that specific. I would have assumed, yeah, like their hands need to be somewhere near the head. And therefore, Rabbi Shimon says, I, so I wouldn't have known that they were supposed to do this specific laying on of hands unless it had said so. Just, just telling me their hands are there is not good enough to tell me that, that they need to do this. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Gamar Rosh Rosh Me'ol. So Rabbi Yehuda said, I mean, the imaginary Rabbi Yehuda, because as I said before, Rabbi Yehuda himself is 
not alive anymore at the time when we're writing this Gemara. But it were Rabbi Yehuda here, he would say, well, I can learn that information using a Gzera Shava. A Gzera Shava is when you have the same word in, or even a similar word in two different places, and you import halachic information across the hyperlink that is created by these two similar words that are you know, sort of metaphorically connected to each other. And theoretically, um, the you can only make a Xerashava if you inherited one. Now, if the system worked perfectly, that would mean that everybody would agree about what all the Xerashavas are because they would all come directly from Moshe because no one could ever have invented one. There are machlokot all over the Gemara about Xerashavas. And so it seems like if that was really always the rule, then there was a glitch somewhere along the line. <laughs> the tradition got corrupted. Or maybe that was not consistently across all generations really the rule. Maybe there were generations in which people um, felt that it was appropriate to make up a new Xerashava. But I think it's the Ramban who points out that if it were truly legal to make up any Xerashava you want, you could make the Torah mean almost anything because there are enough common words that are all over the place that if I can now connect any two psukim I want, then I can, you know, derive any law I want to, including some truly strange ones. Um, because, uh, you know, anything that's true in this sentence that has the word is in it is also, of course, going to be true of that sentence over there that has the word is in it. You can't interpret a book that way and have the book have any integrity at all. So you have to have some kind of limitation on this. And usually the traditional assumption is that the interpretation, the limitation on it is that you can only make Xerashava if your teacher taught you that this particular word is supposed to be linked to this other particular word, which doesn't mean that the teacher necessarily has to have given you a tradition about what that link means or what information is being imported between the two laws. And that is absolutely open to dispute. But if you don't have the link, you can't do anything about it. And so it seems like Rabbi, what we're claiming here is that Rabbi Yehuda had an, a tradition that this word head was supposed to be connected to the word head um, about the Ola, which I believe would be the one at the beginning of this week's Parsha when we have a number of times, um, yeah, so for example, if we just go back to the first one in this Parsha, the first, um, the first several sacrifices in this Parsha are Olot, and Ola is a sacrifice which is completely burned. Um, and the ones being described here are voluntary, voluntary. So in chapter one, verse four, it says about the, the person bringing the Ola, the Samach Yado al Rosh Ola, and he will put his hand on the head of the Ola, the Nirzalo Lechaperalav, and then it will be accepted for him to atone for him. Okay, so if you have a tradition that our verse about the sin offering for the community is supposed to be linked to that verse by the word head, then you say whatever it is that that person in verse four was supposed to, in sorry in chapter one verse four was supposed to do to the head of that animal, the elders then are supposed to do to this animal in chapter four verse fifteen. In in that case, you no longer you no longer need basically the rest of the verse. You just need something that includes the elders of the congregation and the head of the animal. You don't even need as many words as we were claiming a little bit earlier you needed, right? The elders, their hands on the head of the animal. You don't even need that. Just any sentence that includes the word the el elders and the word, the words the head of the animal will, will do. That's enough. And then you can draw your little hyperlink and say whatever was happening over here in chapter one, verse four is also happening to this bull. And that I think is why it doesn't matter very much whether what Rabbi Yehuda said at the end of the previous page of this source packet, right? What he said up here, um, that they could just say the elders of the congregation, their hands on the head of the bull. I don't think it matters whether he really meant that or not, 
because by the time we get to his having a Xerashava down here about the, the head here being connected to the head of the Ola, it doesn't make any difference what the verse says, as long as it still has the word head and the word elders so that we know who that's who's, who's doing it. So why, Deborah, why did he even provide that, that answer on the page before? Why didn't he just go straight to, well, I take it from a Xerashava? So in fairness to Rabbi Yehuda, he didn't do any of this. He's long dead and we're reconstructing his position without his involvement. Um, but in terms of why we went through this multi-step process, the Gemara likes to do that and it likes to hold in reserve the answer it knows it's planning to find compelling and not give it until the very end. And there are a lot of theories about why it does that. The... Um, best I can say is that that's its style. Um, possibly, okay. possibly because the more um, rejected options you pre present, the less chance there is that somebody later on will say, hey, you didn't think of this, right? Because we actually presented all the things that we thought of and said why we don't like them. Um, or just possibly because it's easier to remember, easier to keep track of, easier to recite, any of these is possible. Right, I'm not saying to not go through the, the entire argument from beginning to end. I'm saying only to, to cut out that silly part <laughs> that, that we're not really expected to believe that Rabbi Yehuda said or whatever, and just have him go straight to the Xera Shava part. I think because it, it's there in order to demonstrate that Rabbi Shimon wants no part of any of this because he really thinks that the word is necessary. Yeah. Uh -huh. he, doesn't, he doesn't think there's a basis for having a drasha at all here. He, he, which is why he's only got three judges. Um, so I, I think, I think it, it weakens Rabbi Yehuda, but it strengthens Rabbi Shimon. I, I see. Um, in any case, it seems that now that the real reason why Rabbi Shimon, or an additional reason why Rabbi Shimon does not um, buy any of Rabbi Yehuda's argumentation is because fundamentally the problem is he just doesn't have the same tradition that Rabbi Yehuda did. Right? He, uh, ultimately what it boils down to is Rabbi Shimon, sorry, I forgot to expand the abbreviation there, Lo gamar rosh rosh meolah. He doesn't have a tradition that he's supposed to uh, connect the word head here with the word head back in chapter one of Vayikra about the Ola. And without that tradition, he, even if he wanted to, he couldn't make the interpretation that Rabbi Yehuda is making. So it ends up being about what in what particular thing you learn from your teacher more than what you think the Torah is talking about in the end here. Mm -hmm. um, it is, by the way, for all of these people, a uh, I believe Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda are both late enough that this is an, an act of, of, you know, hope, we'll call it, to be kind, to even be discussing this because the Beit HaMikdash didn't exist in their time. Right? This is, they, they were not talking about something that they actually had observed or hoped to observe anytime soon because there were no sacrifices. Um, but, and to the extent that there was a tradition about how this was done, it would seem that that tradition had been lost. But it's also a relatively rare thing to have happen. It could easily be that even with the temple standing, it didn't happen for hundreds of years at a time. Because you have to have the Sanhedrin make a particular kind of mistake, and then they have to publicly admit to having made that mistake. And that's a, an unusual combination with uh, politicians who are also great scholars. Um, anyway, okay, so next week we are going to see um, a different model for what it might mean for the elders, for elders to have placing of hands, and we're going to talk about the actual 
uh, designating of people as elders by placing hands on their heads. Um, but uh, that's it for what I have tonight. Are there questions? No more questions from me. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry I was a little bit muddled about the, the calendar stuff at the beginning. Hopefully we're moving back into territory where I feel like I have a stronger grasp on reality. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you.